Uh, let's uh, go through the slides. I haven't got many. There are about 15, but I am going to be talking at some pace because I've only got 45 minutes or so. Uh, and uh, I've received a number of questions, uh, over 100. And so what I've tried to do is incorporate as many answers in the next half an hour as I can, at least in headline form. Uh, and then uh, when I see you for the full day training, uh, we'll be able to talk about it in a lot more detail. So um, in terms of... Um, the uh, definition uh, and the makeup of the Domestic Abuse Act, you'll see that it's, it's quite nicely set out actually. It's divided into seven parts and uh, it makes it fairly easy to go through. It's not a very long piece of legislation either, uh, but it is very comprehensive. And uh, for the first time ever in history, uh, there is a statutory definition of domestic abuse, a legal definition of domestic abuse, emphasizing, uh, of course, you'll see the change in language, violence uh, taken out, abuse inserted across the board with criminal legislation as well, emphasizing that, of course, as we all know, domestic abuse is not just physical violence, uh, but can uh, encompass many, many things, non-exhaustive list, really emotional, psychological abuse, controlling and coercive behaviour. And uh, what you may know has uh, previously as financial abuse is being changed to economic abuse. Now, economic abuse is an interesting concept under the new law, and we await guidance. Uh, but uh, it's wider than financial abuse. And uh, the uh, definition is going to cover any behavior that has a substantial effect on a person's ability to acquire, use, maintain assets, money, and or other property and goods and services, or the offense now of restricting access to goods and services, money and access. So transport, food, housing, benefits. So running up credit ratings uh, that affect other people is going to be a form of abuse, preventing people from, let's say, using the family car. Uh, we know that's already controlling and coercive behavior, uh, but it will come under its own definition of uh, economic abuse. So all agencies working with families uh, will need to be aware of this extended definition in practice to ensure appropriate and timely referrals are made, necessary steps are taken, uh, and uh, that would include, of course, agencies like housing, criminal investigation, benefit applications, all aspects of safeguarding. The aim of uh, the definition and the act as well is to ensure that all types of relationships where there's a connection between people are covered, family members, widened to ex-partners. So extending the scope of controlling and coercive behavior. So it will be a no longer a requirement for the alleged perpetrator and the victim uh, alleged to live together in order to get protection. Uh, so that even if one leaves an abusive relationship, uh, we know that former partners may still subject victims to ongoing control and co coercive behaviour post-separation. And so the new law will cover uh, those aspects also uh, recognising, as the existing law does in civil proceedings, uh, child on parent abuse, adolescent on parent abuse, sibling to sibling abuse, um, you know, uh, the uh, definition of connected persons is fairly wide. Uh, the only thing that was taken out uh, from uh, the bill stage uh, is uh, carers not being recognised under this definition, and that's uh, quite a big criticism. There's also been a fairly major shift already this year uh, in the way courts have uh, approached controlling and coercive behaviour following the precedent case of Justice Hayden uh, at the beginning of the year in 2021, F versus M, uh, which uh, we will go through uh, at the one day training. Now, 
uh, I did have lots of questions about children uh, and uh, how they will be uh, recognized uh, in uh, the new provisions. Now, the definition covers children age 16 or over. Parliament had not been prepared as we thought previously, given some of the discussions that were taking place, uh, that children uh, under 16 uh, will also be part of the definition. Children under 16 uh, will uh, still be dealt with within the existing child protection procedures, but do note that the law does recognise children as victims. And where this is going to be key for children is when we look at thresholds. Please note this. So the Act does specifically relate to, and uh, uh, the terminology refers to children as victims, and in reference to children's safeguarding and applications and input by professionals, note that the Act has extended the definition of harm once more. So the existing definition, of course, is that a child will have suffered harm if they see or hear or know about domestic abuse. So they don't have to be present. They could be upstairs, couldn't they? Or they could be at school. Now, under the extended definition, children will have suffered harm if they experience the effects of domestic abuse. It's an interesting concept, be interesting to see how it's used by professionals. What would it look like? One can only guess now. I suspect that it could be used fairly widely. So let's say uh, if a parent is a victim of domestic abuse and therefore can't meet the children's needs by way of uh, looking after them, cooking the meals, getting up in the morning, getting them to school, that could be classed as an effect of domestic abuse. Uh, if the children lack motivation at school, they're isolated, uh, uh, they're tearful, they can't concentrate, they're not uh, uh, being included uh, socially uh, because of the way they're presenting, that could be uh, an effect of uh, domestic abuse, so all of these knock-on ripple effects. Uh, so those involved in PLO, pre-proceedings, public law, uh, we'll need to think very carefully about how we may amend uh, our definition of harm and uh, in terms of our referrals as well. So uh, in terms of the police, now, Police have been given much wider powers and uh, there is a provision for domestic abuse protection notices and following those domestic abuse protection orders. So the current law has been in place. It's called uh, domestic violence protection notices and domestic violence protection orders uh, currently. So that's all being amended. And uh, the current law is being extended uh, because breach of these uh, on the spot notices that police can issue. They're like mini restraining orders. So police get called out, they can issue a notice uh, that can um, prevent further abuse or exclude someone from a property uh, for up to 48 hours. Uh, breach of those aren't a criminal offence. And so sometimes uh, they're about as useful as a chocolate teapot uh, in terms of just being a piece of paper, uh, because those that know the system know that they have no bite. So the Domestic Abuse Act uh, is going to uh, extend. So breach of a notice will be an automatic criminal offence, arrest of, arrestable, of course. And then uh, the orders that can be formalised by a magistrate's court following issue of a uh, on the spot domestic abuse notice. Uh, currently, it's 28 days but this is going to be extended to, could be indefinitely until further order. There's not going to be a time limit on them. And uh, not only is the terminology changing and the scope, there'll be extra conditions that one may attach to these notices uh, above and beyond exclusion. 
and prevention of further abuse uh in terms of um requiring perpetrators on making an order to uh seek mental health uh provision or domestic violence or domestic abuse perpetrator uh, programs etc also these notices and orders uh, will now cover abuse that happens outside of the UK if it's a criminal offence here and I'm going to come on to that in a second it's a very interesting uh, amendment to the law. Another very interesting and important uh, amendment is that currently only a superintendent or higher can apply for these notices these on the spot mini restraining orders uh, to be formalised uh, into an order at the Magistrates Court. So a major change is that it won't be limited to the police seeking orders. What the new Act provides for is third party applications and or the victims themselves. So the victims can pursue an order following a notice and notice itself will be good evidence to get an order. The police can still, friends, families, and the law hasn't specified third parties in terms of statutory agencies, but at the bare minimum, one would expect it will be the local authority that would be able to formalize these notices into orders upon application and or possibly health, we don't know yet, waiting for the guidance. Also, the courts, all courts in any specified proceedings, so criminal, civil, children's proceedings, divorce, let's say, will be able to make these orders of their own volition without an application. Now, use of these, uh, what they're going to be called, DAPNs and DAPOs uh, is going to be piloted in uh, local areas first, so a select few areas uh, for a year or so, maybe up to three before it's rolled out nationally. So uh, the guidance will change uh, quite a lot, but uh, all professionals involved uh, in safeguarding children, adults, uh, and uh, uh, the pervasive issue of domestic abuse uh, will have particular regard uh, to the changes in police powers because uh, it may be uh, that these DAPNs are issued uh, instead of the police exercising uh, their police powers in terms of uh, removing children from home for up to 72 hours. So uh, instead of them uh, removing children under their existing powers in the Children Act, uh, then uh, going forward, uh, it may be that these DAPNs are issued uh, more readily because the hope for uh, this part of the Act going forward uh, is that this will be the go-to order. So instead of people having to wait for court hearings, going to court, making applications, this will be the go-to. And uh, there'll be some commonality between the 14 other pieces of legislation around domestic abuse, both criminal and civil. Just to put it into context for you, uh, in uh, the year ending March 2020, just before uh, the first lockdown, there are around 5,000 of these DVPNs issued. Um, and uh, around 6,000 of the orders uh, made uh, as standalone or following a, a notice. Uh, by uh, December, we were up to about 15,000. So we know that lockdown and the pandemic has massively exacerbated uh, domestic abuse uh, and the protection that was needed. Uh, by the end of the year, in 2020, uh, there were almost 40,000 applications made to the family courts for non-molestation orders, which was an increase of 89% uh, during uh, the uh, year preceding. The government hope uh, that as this will be the go-to, they anticipate around 55,000 of these being issued every year. Uh, and uh, that will be instead of non-molestation orders, restraining orders and occupation orders. So consent, I had quite a few questions around consent 
And in terms of consent, if a victim is scared of uh, agreeing to either a notice being issued or um, a order uh, being uh, given by the magistrate's court thereafter, it can be issued without consent. Of course, one would need to ascertain the victim or alleged victim's wishes and feelings, but it's not absolute. So it very much mirrors uh, in its uh, anticipation the law on forced marriage protection orders, which we will go into in a lot more detail at the one day training. There's been uh, some recent case law again around uh, capacitous adult victims who oppose the make making of a forced marriage uh, protection order. And uh, the president of the family division uh, in the case of RIK 2020 uh, at the Court of Appeal decided that the court can still make the order. Consent or refusal is not determinative. Agencies uh, will need to have regard to this. Okay, so, um, DAPOs uh, won't cover neighbour disputes, work-related abuse, stalking, uh, abuse to professionals uh, in the conduct of their new job. Uh, polygraph testing. Uh, the government intends to start a three-year pilot of uh, mandatory polygraph examinations on the domestic abuse perpetrators released on licence and identified as being high risk. So uh, there will be an expectation that these individuals take a bolograph test uh, for uh, a three month period uh, post release from custody and every six months thereafter, unless the test is failed and then they will take it more frequently. Now, the testing uh, used to monitor existing compliance with license conditions has been the information that's been used by the government to uh, enable them to put this into the piece of legislation. Their data shows that accuracy rate of 89%, Beth, so you may have your own views on that. The examinations will be carried out by qualified probation officers. Okay. Also, um, conditions such as tagging, uh, electronic monitoring, uh, will uh, be able to be uh, attached to notice uh, orders uh, provided for by the magistrate's court. Claire's law. Now, uh, Claire's law, which is a scheme, you may know it as the right to ask, uh, the right to know, uh, following uh, Claire Wood, who was murdered at age 36 uh, in 2009 uh, by her ex-partner who she'd met on Facebook. And uh, he had quite a uh, long history uh, of abuse, including custodial sentences uh, for uh, harassment, holding a woman at knife point, uh, failing to comply with a restraining order. And uh, she uh, suspected that he was having an affairs and uh, so she broke up with him. But following uh, uh, breaking uh, up with him, uh, he became very abusive to her and she informed the police uh, that he threatened to burn her house down, smash her windows, have her stabbed, uh, 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 commit some violence on her with an iron, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there was no action taken. And uh, four months to the day after the relationship ended, uh, she was found dead at her home, having been strangled and set on fire uh, by him uh, before he hung himself. And so following her death, uh, her father launched a campaign uh, which resulted uh, in uh, Claire's Law as a scheme. Now, the criticisms of this scheme because it wasn't a statutory obligation, uh, was that historically uh, there's no joining up of the dots nationally and there's pretty poor response. Uh, uh, it's not good enough. And so inconsistency around disclosure uh, needs to be looked at and uh, the police are going to go through fairly robust uh, protocol and statutory guidance uh, now that this has been placed on a statutory footing uh, there. Now, 
as I mentioned a moment ago, the Act uh, also uh, extends the jurisdiction of the UK courts so that where appropriate, uh, UK nationals and those uh, who are residents of uh, uh, the UK and commit certain violent and sexual offences outside of the UK can now be brought to trial. They can already under the Istanbul Convention and various other pieces of legislation, uh, but uh, the Domestic Abuse Act is widening that. Therefore, committing offence overseas is going to be liable in the UK for specified offences. So as professionals, you will need to have an understanding and be very aware of the impact on uh, culturally specific forms of abuse, such as forced marriage, honour based violence, dowry related offences uh, and another, another uh, number of other offences. Uh, there'll be conditions uh, able to be placed uh, to these uh, orders once made as well. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, how that uh, looks like in practice, I think, and how the courts deal with that. So if we move on, uh, I'm not quite sure how we're doing for time. I think we've got about 20 minutes left. So part six, uh, new offences, uh, offences involving violent or abusive behaviour. So um, the rough sex offence, some of these things I think have been in the news and uh, we know about them. Section 72 of the Act restates the current law, uh, making it clear that a person cannot consent to the infliction of serious harm uh, all by extension to their own death for purposes of obtaining sexual gratification. Uh, consent uh, is not a defence. Consent to sexual gratification is not a defence, uh, which actually codifies the principle laid down uh, in 1993 uh, by R versus Brown, uh, but again for the first time being put into statute. So uh, the defendant will also be liable to prosecution for grievous bodily harm with intent uh, inflicting grievous bodily harm. So it's going to work alongside uh, the existing law. Non-fatal uh, strangulation um, becomes an offence and uh, relevant in situations whereby the alleged perpetrator strangles or intentionally affects the victim's breathing so as to control or intimidate them. The reasoning behind this uh, is because it's been argued that uh, in these situations, alleged perpetrators were avoiding punishment uh, because their actions often leave no visible injury, making it harder to uh, prosecute. Disclosing of private sexual photos, intimate images and or film there is an extension to the existing offence uh, of disclosing uh, private sexual photographs and films without consent of the individual. And the extension is the threat. So if one threatens to disclose intimate images, uh, this will now be a uh, offence under the new act. Okay. Now, if any of you have ever supported anyone going to court uh, for domestic abuse um, in the family courts, the civil courts, uh, you will know that they do not mirror the criminal courts in terms of uh, how one obtains support. In the criminal courts, one is automatically entitled to a lawyer. In the family courts, the child protection courts, the safeguarding courts, one is not. In practice, what that looks like is that alleged perpetrators can cross-examine alleged victims because there's very little aid, little legal aid, sorry, uh, very little legal aid for domestic abuse. And therefore, we have many, many cases, the majority of cases, in fact, are litigants in person. And there's probably nothing more prohibitive to seeking protection and nothing more harrowing and terrifying than having to face, if you have the courage to do so, your perpetrator or your alleged perpetrator in court. 
it's a barrier to seeking protection. So there will be a presumption that all alleged victims will be eligible for special measures in all the courts. There will be a statutory prohibition on any victim being cross-examined by the person they are alleging to have committed the offence against them. The court on trial will appoint a court-funded or state-funded lawyer for the purposes of trial. They won't be a legal advisor able to give legal advice generally on the case, uh, but they will be there uh, to uh, conduct the cross-examination both ways. So it will work both ways. Victims have to apply to the court currently for special measures in terms of video links, screen, separate waiting areas, etc. The shift is an automatic eligibility for special measures, removing the burden on the victim to prove that they need the resource and putting a positive burden on the judges and the courts to provide the resource. The starting point is that anyone that goes to court uh, where domestic abuse is the application is automatically vulnerable. In the criminal courts, uh, victims automatically get special measures, uh, but in the family courts, they don't. So uh, the courts are going to have to think very, very carefully uh, about uh, how they fund this, provide this. This is going to have to be put in place uh, fairly swiftly. No one should be scared at seeking protection. And therefore, what this law aims to do is give some sort of equality of arms, especially where one person can afford a lawyer and one person can't. Okay, now, quite a big chunk of the new act uh, uh, relates to uh, local authority provision and accommodation, uh, homelessness. The ex existing legislation is such that uh, alleged victims of domestic abuse who are not in priority needs, and priority need uh, would uh, look like something like pregnancy or dependent children. They need to satisfy what's called a vulnerability test uh, by showing that they are more vulnerable as a result of fleeing domestic abuse. Under the new law, uh, the victims will no longer need to prove the vulnerability element uh, as a result of abuse so as to access accommodation secured by the local authority. Of course, the local authority are going to have their own evidential thresholds for this. They will be provided with additional funding to deliver this new duty uh, and some of the guide code of uh, uh, practices I've seen, the uh, homelessness code of guidance, for example, uh, states that councils uh, may be seeking information from healthcare in relation to uh, domestic abuse concerns. Uh, the code of guidance sets out uh, in draft form uh, some of the evidence that may be appropriate, uh, including friends and relatives uh, alongside health and social care. However, the guidance uh, looks like it's going to be quite clear that local authorities must ensure that their inquiries do not provoke further violence or abuse, uh, and that they should not approach any alleged perpetrator. And uh, if evidence from health, social care, family, friends, the police is not available or easily obtainable, it should not be a requirement for support. It'd be very interesting to see how the local authorities uh, come up with a piece of guidance that allows them to have a threshold, I suppose. Uh, they will also be given new powers in terms of granting uh, secure lifetime tenancies, changing tenancies, um, sole lifetime tenancies, uh, all kinds of things happening uh, there. Okay, so we're at five past two, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I know there's some chat, but I can't see it as I'm sharing this screen. So I'll, I'll try and finish a couple of minutes earlier and have a look at it. Now, the Domestic Abuse Commissioner 
The Act establishes the Office of the Domestic Abuse Commissioner for the first time, never had public leadership on domestic abuse like this before. And uh, she's already actually uh, in place, Nicole Jacobs, her name is, and uh, she's got her own Twitter page going, her own Facebook, her own website, you can have a look at it. And uh, she was appointed in 2019. And so she will be providing public leadership on domestic abuse issues and playing a key role in overseeing and monitoring the provision of domestic abuse service uh, nationally. Uh, she uh, will uh, do this working jointly with public bodies, all organisations, uh, and really raising awareness around the issue. And uh, she's going to have uh, to publish reports, lay them before Parliament. Uh, she's going to have to come up with strategy and action plans and see that they're implemented, holding public bodies to account. There'll be a, there's a mandatory statutory duty to cooperate with the Commissioner uh, within 56 days of uh, the Commissioner seeking uh, any information. Now, she's going to be assisted in her role by the makeup of domestic abuse partnership panels, which is very, very important for all public bodies to be aware that these are coming in. I've already seen some local authorities draft guidance on uh, these uh, that are starting to be written. And partnership panels, the domestic abuse local partnership boards uh, or panels, uh, are specified in the Act and uh, it's a statutory duty for each local authority uh, to convene these. So if you already sit on MARAC or you're involved in MAPA or anything like that, uh, it may be that uh, you'll be very interested uh, in being part of this. Uh, and uh, the uh, partnership panels uh, as mandatory statutory partners uh, will be uh, representatives from local authority, both children and adults, health, uh, police, plus uh, charitable organisations, relevant partner agencies, housing, benefits, probation, etc. Uh, there will be a budget given. Uh, for uh, further provision of refuges and safe accommodation. Partnership panels uh, will need to develop and publish a strategy for the provision of support in their local area, bearing in mind uh, their communities and uh, their uh, cultures and uh, all, all the issues relevant to them locally. Needs assessments, risks assessments, uh, giving effect to the strategy through commissioning, or decommissioning decisions, monitoring and evaluating the effectiveness of the strategy, reporting back to the commissioner, um, and uh, having regard to all uh, the statutory guidance under this part of the Act, which we will talk about in a lot more detail uh, if you come and see me for the one day training. So, um, as I said, uh, we're looking at a sort of six week review period and then a six week analysis. Uh, and uh, I think it's hoped uh, that these boards will start to be convened, these panels will start to be convened uh, in early September. There has been some funding uh, given for this year and next. Uh, it, it hasn't been ring fenced, I don't think, post 2022, uh, but there will be a statutory obligation on uh, the local authorities uh, to comply with this. OK, now also uh, some of the funding uh, under the strategy element of uh, these local protocols uh, will uh, be in terms of advocacy support, development of personal safety plans, liaison with other agencies, GPs, social workers, etc., domestic abuse prevention advice, uh, specialist support for victims with relevant protected characteristics, complex needs, uh, faith services, mental health, drug and alcohol, immigration, children's support, including play therapy, children's advocacy, housing related support, counselling uh, and other intervention. Okay, so uh, it being almost 10 past two, uh, we're doing quite well for time. Uh, 
I just want to uh, go through uh, some of the criticisms that uh, uh, are being levied at the new act, some of the things that were taken out from the bill earlier drafts uh, and as a result the act not actually being as far reaching as had been anticipated uh, and as a result may have less direct impact on uh, certain uh, areas uh, that uh, were mooted uh, at the House of Commons. So time will tell. Uh, I don't think we're done with it yet. There's a lot of push by agencies like Refuge and Women's Aid and South or Black Sisters uh, for uh, further uh, consideration, especially as the guidance is being written. Uh, so some of the criticisms that we'll discuss in the autumn, uh, gender bias, actually children under 16 uh, needing to have a bigger role here, uh, the lack of protection for women that have no leave to remain, uh, how long it's going to take to implement all of this. They're talking about next spring at the earliest, say, for the panels this September. Uh, how it's going to work with existing law is quite confusing. There was talk of employer support for domestic abuse. That's gone. Uh, screening for acquired brain injury sustained and as a result of domestic abuse being a mandatory requirement seems to have been taken out. Uh, there's less about child and adolescent to parent violence than uh, we hoped for uh, in terms of how the police would deal with uh, that very, very delicate area. Uh, the baby blind spot uh, that was talked about in the bill stage uh, has gone uh, in terms of recognising uh, the unborn fetus and uh, newborn babies and infants up to the age of two. Uh, the stalking register, again, uh, has been a, a big area of concern. Uh, what is the commitment to funding? We need to pin that down. Uh, and also, as I said at the beginning, unpaid carers uh, and paid carers uh, were part of the definition of connected persons, and that's been taken out. Also, the defence, the reasonable defence clause in criminal law for victims uh, has gone. So I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we're there. I think there's more to come. I really do. Now, if you do join me, and I hope you do sign up for it for the one day training that we will try to deliver in early autumn to coincide with uh, the introduction of panels and the statutory guidance as it comes out, hopefully over the summer, uh, we'll be looking at this act, the Domestic Abuse Act, uh, in uh, forensic detail uh, alongside some of the cases that I've alluded to, how it works with the, Child, the Children Act 1989, the Care Act 2014, and all of these other criminal uh, pieces of uh, legislation and law. Also, fact-finding hearings in court, what that looks like for contact for children and the four planet model of uh, domestic abuse, the role of guardians and welfare officers, uh, the uh, role of uh, intervention provision, uh, service provision, MARAC, MAPA, uh, the impact or uh, continuing impact uh, on the pandemic uh, as we go forward on domestic abuse and domestic homicide and the delays that the courts are experiencing, barring orders, uh, safeguarding with adults under the Care Act. So we're going to be looking at all of these things. So it's going to be quite a full, full day encompassing the new law and having an understanding of the existing law and how they work uh, both for your agencies uh, and uh, uh, for uh, the uh, police uh, and the courts as well. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to, I think I'll just uh, go through. So the link is there. I don't know if I can cl click it, but I think someone's going to put the link in the chat box for me. So I think probably what I'll do is I'll stop sharing this and then I can have a look. Uh, yes. So thank you very much. Just on time with two minutes to spare. Uh, and uh, I hope that you have found that run through Coach and Horses uh, interesting enough uh, to uh, pique your interest for a full day's training. So, yeah, thank you.